Okay, so this is a video for Act 1, Scene 4 of Romeo and Juliet. Um, we're now on the Sunday evening. Remember, we began on the Sunday morning. Um, we're outside the Capulet's house with Romeo, Mercutio, Benvolio and five or six other maskers. Remember, the party is a masquerade ball, which means that people would have masks covering their face um, during the party. And this is how the Montagues are able to effectively sneak in to the Capulet party undetected. Um, just a note before we begin, a really important character in this particular scene is Mercutio. We talked before in the earlier scenes about nominative determinism and nom remember meaning name, a character being determined by the name they are given by the writer. Um, Shakespeare uses lots of the names to indicate things about the characters and their uh, personalities within. So remember Benvolio coming from the word benevolent, which means good and kind. In a similar way, Mercutio um, reminds us of the word mercurial. Mercurial comes from the word mercury. You'll know mercury is a um, metal which um, changes state um, depending on, on uh, different factors. Sometimes it's liquid, for instance. Um, but um, mercurial just means subject to sudden changes of mood or mind. And um, Mercutio is quite an impulsive and quite a tempestuous character and, and that kind of mercurial um, kind of characteristic, that changeable nature, um, that sort of tempestuous character um, is represented in his name. Similar to the way that Tybalt represents the idea that he's a tyrant, aggressive, corrupt, in some way sinister, controlling, those kind of things. Um, so in this scene, uh, Benvolio and Mercutio persuade Romeo to join them um, at the party and kind of try to cheer him up again, try, try to focus him on, on finding somebody other than Rosaline. Okay, what shall this speech be spoke for our excuse, or shall we on without an apology? The date is out of such prolixity. Prolixity, sorry. We'll have no Cupid hoodwinked with a scarf bearing a tartar's painted bow of lake, scaring the ladies like a crow keeper. Nor no without book prologue faintly spoke, but the prompter for our entrance. But after the prompter for our entrance, but let them measure us by what they will. We'll measure them a measure and be gone. So Romeo says, what shall be our excuse? How, how will we explain why we're there? We're not supposed to be at this party. And Benvolio says, this is not the kind of thing where you really announce yourselves. We're just going to sneak in and they can judge us on our dancing and our conduct at the party and see if they um, appreciate us being there. Romeo says, give me a torch. I'm not for this ambling. Being but heavy, I will bear the light. This line here, being but heavy, re represents Romeo's depression. He, he's heavy with depression, with sorrow, but he will bear the light. Now, that's a play on words. Literally, he's asking for a torch, a flame to hold in his hand so that he can see in the darkness. That's what he means by I will bear the light. But it equally is a play on words. He's talking about his heaviness becoming light, this idea of, of hope. And it symbolises the potential for a new love. The juxtaposition foreshadows the tension between the conflict to come and the idealism of Romeo and Juliet's relationship, how they kind of idealise um, their love um, when they first meet. And that's what allows it to um, progress so quickly. So it's about the idea of the potential for meeting somebody else. Mercutio says... Nay, gentle Romeo, we must have you dance. Not I, believe me. You have dancing shoes with nimble soles. I have a soul of lead, so stakes me to the ground I cannot move. You are a lover. Borrow Cupid's wings. Remember, Cupid is the god of love and desire, often um, represented with kind of wings and a, and a bow and arrow um, to shoot um, lovers and make them fall in love with one another. So there's this idea of uh, the metaphor Borrow Cupid's wings, find a new love, and soar with them above a common ground. I am too sore and pierced with his shaft to soar with his light feathers, and so bound I cannot bound a pitch above dull woe. Under love's heavy burden do I sink. So again, there's this imagery of heavy burden, sinking. I have a soul of lead, all this imagery to do with depression. And to sink in it, should you burden love too great oppression for a tender thing? Is love a tender thing? Romeo asks that rhetorical question. It is too rough, too rude, too boisterous, and it pricks like thorn. Romeo here is drawing attention to that duplicitous nature of love, the idea of love being painful. It pricks like thorn, that simile 
is an imagery of it creates imagery of pain, but also how suddenly it strikes and pierced, pricks. The idea that it suddenly strikes you quickly and hard and has a sudden impact on you when you're hit with love. Mercutio says, if love be rough with you, be rough with love. Prick love for pricking and you beat love down. Give me a case to put my visage in. Puts on a mask. A visor for a visor. What care I what curious eye doth cope deformities? Here are the beetle brow, here are the beetle brows shall blush for me. So he, he's putting on a mask to cover his face before they enter the party. Now, this line I think is important. So when he says, if love be rough with you, be rough with love. The personification of love shows love is toxic, it's corrupting. If it's rough with you, be rough with love. And this subversion of love as something unpleasant, as something toxic, is called anti-metaboly. This is the reversed phrasing. You see how it says, be rough with you, be rough with love, and it reverses the phrase. It says the same phrase in reverse. That's called anti-metaboly. just means saying the same words again, but in reverse. Benvolio says, come knock and enter and no sooner in, but every man betake him to his legs. A torch for me, let wanton's light of heart tickle the senseless rushes with their heels, for I am proverbed with a grandsire phrase. I'll be a candle holder and look on. The game was ne'er so fair and I am done. So Romeo's basically consigned himself to being a wallflower. He's saying, no, I'm going to stand around and watch you. I I'm not in the mood for, for dancing and, and love and frivolity. I'm simply too depressed. Duns the mouse that constable's own word. If thou art done, we'll draw thee from the mire. Or, save your reverence, love wherein thou stickest, up to the ears. Come, we burn daylight, ho. Nay, that's not so. I mean, sir, in delay. We waste our lights in vain, like lights by day. Take our good meaning, for our judgment sits five times in that air once in our five wits. Okay. And we mean well in going to this mask, but tis no wit to go. So Romeo senses that it's not wise for them to go to this party. Why, may one ask? I dreamt a dream tonight. So Romeo starts to talk about some prophecy that he's had. He had a dream which suggested that this wasn't the best idea. Mercutio responds, and so did I. Well, what was yours? That dreamers often lie. Mercutio is sceptical about love, but equally is sceptical about these ideas to do with fate. And he, he's quite a challenging character in that sense. He likes to um, kind of pick apart and, and challenge um, things that, that Romeo believes and that the others believe. He's quite a, quite, um, a controversial character, I suppose. He, he likes to challenge um, the viewpoints of others. In bed asleep when they do dream things true. So M Romeo says, yeah, dreamers often lie in bed asleep, but they do dream about true things. So it's a play on words there. He's using the, the idea of lie as in to not tell the truth. Romeo's using the idea that, yes, you lie in bed when you dream. Very good, Mikisha. So this next speech is really important. This part here, and then just over the page, is what's called the Queen Mab speech. Um, the Queen Mab speech is um, a really important structural point in the play. And you can see that I've just written here, structure. The Queen Mab speech sets up love as parasitic and toxic. It sets up this idea that it feeds off and corrupts people and that love is in fact not necessarily a, a good, innocent, pure thing, that actually it has a darker side to it. Um, and so that, that's a structural point in the play where this vision of love begins to change. And so Queen Mab is, is a mythical character. She's, she's the bringer of dreams. And in the um, tasks that you're going to do in the next week, I'll actually give you a bit of a, an annotation task to give you with a picture of Mab and to kind of annotate on different parts so you can imagine um, what this character was supposed to look like. But she's supposedly the person who brings you your dreams at night, makes you dream certain things. So this is Mercutio's um, kind of challenging, quite... Um, almost a little bit cheeky discussion about what love is really like and he subverts the idea of love and makes it seem kind of corrupted, toxic, parasitic, feeding off others. Okay. Oh then, I see Queen Mab has been with you. 
She is the fairy's midwife and she comes in shape no bigger than an agate stone on the forefinger of an alderman, drawn with a team of little atomi over men's noses as they lie asleep. Her chariot is an empty hazelnut, made by the joiner squirrel or old grub. Time out of mind the fairy's coachmakers, her wagon makers, her wagon spokes made of long spinner's legs, the cover of the wings of grasshoppers, the traces of the smallest spider web, her collars of the moonshine's watery beams, her whip of cricket bone, the lash of film, her wagoner, a small grey coated gnat, not half so big as a round little worm, pricked from the lazy finger of a maid, and in this state she gallops night by night, through lovers' brains, and then they dream of love, over courtiers' knees that dream on curtsies straight, over lawyers' fingers who straight dream on fees, over ladies' lips who straight on kisses dream, which oft the angry man blisters plagues, with blisters plagues, because their breath the sweet with sweetmeats tainted are. Sometimes she gallops over courtier's nose and then dreams he of smelling out a suit. And sometime comes she with the tithe pig's tail tickling a parson's nose as he lies asleep. Then he dreams of another benefice. Sometimes she driveth over a soldier's neck and then dreams he of cutting foreign throats, of breeches and buscados, Spanish blades, of health five fathom deep and then anon drums in his ear at which he starts and wakes and being thus frighted swears a prayer or two and sleeps again this is the very mab that plaits the manes of horses in the night and bakes the elf locks in foul sluttish hairs which once untangled such misfortune bodes this is the hag where maids lie on their back that presses them and learns them first to bear making them women of good carriage this is she. Okay, let's go back and actually annotate that speech because the most important quotations are in that section there. So you can see lots of these parts that I've annotated. So first of all, the first thing I've highlighted here are a couple of quotations. No bigger than an agate stone and little atomai. Okay, now atomai, you can see here I've highlighted for you, tiny creatures, small as atoms. So this imagery of size and proportion shows not only the insignificance of love, but also this sense of great power, the idea that it has the power to influence and corrupt you. And it has quite a subversive, sinister effect. There's all these references to something so small that can control and dominate and dictate you. We've also got here imagery of insects. You see things like grasshoppers, spiders' webs, crickets' bone, things that are quite sinister and unpleasant. And then at the bottom here, You've got some celestial imagery, the idea of fate and the idea of a lack of control in Romeo and Juliet's love. And finally, we've got imagery to do with sickness, uh, corruption, pain, suffering, blisters, plagues. Later on, when Mercutio dies, um, he actually says, a plague on both your houses. So that kind of creates that structural arc where he's using that word plagues again, that idea of the corrupting power of love, the damage, the parasitic nature of love, uh, and this imagery of sickness in Verona. Um, the other thing we've got here is, you can see the bits I've highlighted in uh, green. We've got empty hazelnut on page 23. And then we've got um, sluttish hairs maids lie on their backs this idea of like the empty hazelnut almost like a womb like imagery of fertility and then sluttish maids lying on their backs that idea of um sexual imagery that kind of idea of sexual submission the hag presses them teaches maids to lie on their backs so it subverts ideas of love to do with innocence and now it seems kind of corrupted evil and even the use of the word hag to refer to Queen Mab. She's gone from being a queen to being a hag. There's this idea of love being sinister and evil. It's almost like a kind of seedy underbelly of love, what the true reality of love is like. And so Mercutio really challenges our ideas, this kind of idealised notion of love and makes it seem something unpleasant and threatening and corrupted and sinister. Okay, Romeo's had enough of this. Peace, peace, Mercutio, peace. Thou talks of nothing. 
I talk of dreams, which are the children of an idle brain, begot of nothing but vain fantasy, which is as thin as substance of the air, and more inconstant than the wind, who woos even now the frozen bosom of the north, and being angered, puffs away from thence, turning his side to the dew-dripping south. This wind you talk of blows us from ourselves. Supper is done, and we shall come too late. So Benvolio kind of refocuses them and says, come on, we're going to be late, let's go. Romeo here, though, references his own fate. I fear too early, for my mind misgives some consequence yet hanging in the stars. Again, that celestial imagery, the stars. This reference again to fatalism. Every time we see this reference, this motif of the stars, this motif of the celestial imagery, it reminds us again of notions of fate. Here, Romeo references his own fate, the idea that his destiny is decided, and the fact that he thinks it's hanging in the stars over him creates a sense of trepidation, a sense of anxiety and fear about what might lay in store for him. Finally, he says, of a despised life closed in my breast by some vile forfeit of untimely death, but he that hath in the steerage of my course directs my sail on lusty gentlemen, strike drum. And so here, Romeo, I by some vile forfeit of untimely death. Do you remember the, the um, prince said earlier on, your life shall pay the forfeit of the peace. He thinks the forfeit is going to be the untimely death of someone. So Romeo prophesizes about his own fate, potentially about his own death. There is a sense of fear and trepidation about going to this party and who he might meet there and what might occur from the things that he's seen in his dreams and that sense of anxiety and fear that he's got about his fate. Okay, brilliant. We'll stop there.